Just a note before we begin, this service and the Good Friday service and the Easter Sunday services are actually seen as one continuous worship service. So there will be... service is found in your service leaflet. Blessed be our God. This is the night that Christ, the Son of Man, gathered with his disciples in the upper room. This is the night that Christ, our Lord and Master, took a towel and washed the disciples' feet, calling us to love one another as he has loved us. This is the night that Christ gave us this holy feast that we who eat this bread and drink this cup may here proclaim his perfect sacrifice. This is the night that Christ, the Lamb of God, gave himself into the hands of those who would slay him. The Lord be with you. 
Let us pray. Almighty Father, whose most dear Son on the night before he suffered instituted the sacrament of his body and blood, mercifully grant that we may receive it in thankful remembrance of Jesus Christ our Savior, who in these holy mysteries gives us a pledge of eternal life, and who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is from Exodus, the 12th chapter. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for each household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, shall you make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until morning, Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it a feast. The word of the Lord. Our psalm today is Psalm 78. We will recite each we will read each psalm verse responsively. The congregation will respond with the words in bold. In the daytime he led them with a cloud. He split the hard rocks in the wilderness. He brought waters out of the stony rock. Yet for all this, they sinned more against him. They tested God in their hearts. They spoke spoke against God, saying, Indeed, he smote the stony rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. When the Lord heard this, he was full of wrath. So a fire was because they did not believe in God. So he commanded the clouds above. He rained down manna upon them to eat. So mortals ate the bread of angels. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. I'm reading from John's Gospel, the 13th chapter, beginning at verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet, he put out, bit on his outer garments and resumed his place. He said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Got to watch these people over here. Does anybody remember the movie The Bucket List? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, Morgan Freeman, Jack Nicholson, I'd watch those two guys in any movie, really. Uh, really great actors. Uh, one's a regular Joe, one's a multi-millionaire. They meet in a cancer ward and decide to bust out of the joint. And, uh, and then the, the plot takes on from there. You just need to watch the movie. But anyway, it's predicated on these guys want to do a certain amount of things before they kick the bucket before they die. Uh, and it's a great movie, it's very heartwarming. We all 
are going to do something close to what was in that movie. I'd say most of us, unless we die very suddenly. So let me ask you a question. What would you do if you knew you had one year to live? I'll take three answers just from the crowd. What would you do? Somebody. Love your people. Amen, brother. Pray more. Pray more. Yeah. Go visit all my family and children. Go visit all my family and children. Good answers. Let me ask a further question to really clarify our thinking. What would you do if you had one day to live? Probably a lot of the same thing. Pray even more, right? Yeah. This question occurred to me as I was contemplating the gospel accounts of Jesus' passion and death. In these accounts, we, we actually have a record of what Jesus did knowing that he had one day to live. And I believe it's instructional for those of us who are disciples of Jesus to read the scriptures closely, to pay attention to what our Lord is doing, and then perhaps if we find a gap between what he's doing and perhaps what we are doing, we might want to make a change so that we could grow closer to who he is and what he came to do. So let's explore what Jesus did on that last day before he died. Well, the first thing is he gathers with his disciples. He has spent three years training them. This is the inner group, the 12, including Judas. In John's gospel, in that farewell discourse, he calls them friends, friends of God. And he enjoys the fellowship that only happens when people are all gathered together under God. The love that God pours into all of our hearts is something that makes the community of Christians, the fellowship of believers, the ecclesia, the assembly, something special and something filled with God's presence. That's the sign of fellowship. And fellowship is a holy thing, consecrated to God. Then Jesus has a meal, as we all know. We read this account. It's not any old meal. He's gathering for the Passover. And the Passover is a time where they remember the mighty acts of God in salvation history, the defining narrative of the Old Testament, where the God of Israel hears the groaning of the slaves in Egypt and says, I will come down and I will set you free. Ten plagues, nine plagues happen, and on the tenth one, God says, okay, Pharaoh, since you won't listen to me, I will take the lives of the firstborn of everything in your kingdom, livestock, but also your firstborn children. But the angel of death will come and pass over you if you put the blood of the lamb over the entrance of your houses. And then he gives instructions for the meal, which we read tonight. And this is to be a meal that's unlike any other, eaten in haste, with your sandals on, with your staff ready to go. And so Jesus is celebrating this supper with his disciples in Jerusalem. And then after the third cup, he takes the matzah and he breaks it. He takes it, he blesses it, breaks it, and gives it and says, this is my body. And I'm sure the disciples are going, what? Maybe some of them remembered back in John 6 where Jesus said, my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever therefore eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life in them and I in them. And we believe that it's a spiritual feeding. At, at John 6, people didn't just walk up and start chewing on Jesus' forearm. Uh, it's a spiritual feeding. I think it's, that's the right way to understand that. But it's also a foretaste of the messianic banquet at the end of days. In the end of the book of Revelation, there's going to be a bank, wedding banquet of the Lamb. And the bride of Christ, us, will meet the bridegroom Christ. And we will have a feast like you've never seen. The new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. 
the dead are raised in Christ. We all come before the great white throne of judgment. Those who've done evil go to burn forever. Those of us who are in Christ get to experience joy forever. And it's, we're going to actually have our bodies back, resurrected bodies with no uh, stain of sin affecting us. And it's just going to be a great party. And Holy Communion looks forward to that. Jesus will be there. He gives us sacramental worship, th using things of this creation, this bread and this wine as a means for, for God to work through. And that's the sign of worship. In John 13, we read about Jesus then washing his disciples' feet. And that's unheard of in a culture like this. The, a rabbi taking the role of the least servant in the household because, uh, not to be too indelicate, but you're walking around in a culture and there's a lot of animals around. There's, you got your donkeys and lots of sheep and some camels and there's just poop everywhere. And so the person who washes feet kind of has the least attractive of the duties of the house, let us say. But he says, that's what you ought to be doing. And so against the human impulse to, to create an organization and, and celebrate the hierarchy and all of this, what he's doing here is subverting all of that human ambition and saying, I want you to be a community of servants. Wherever you find the dirt of the world staining somebody, go and wash that. Wherever you find someone in need, Go in my name and meet those needs. That's the sign of service. Then if you read John's gospel especially, he gives some final instructions, some last instructions. It's the famous farewell discourse in John's gospel. It starts with chapter 13, part of which we read tonight. In this we find that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He teaches about the Holy Spirit that he was to send. He says that I, Christ, am the true vine, and if you abide in me, I will live in you, and you will have this life. He said, because the world's so bro broken and lost, you who come in my name, spreading the love of God, will be hated. Evil will rise up against you. And then he says, but don't worry. I have overcome the world. And then he talks about the sorrow turning into joy. And so the community that he created, the servant community, this community gathered around breaking of bread and drinking of wine, is also to be a community of the word. We listen to Jesus. We don't say, yes, but. We simply say, you are our Lord, and Lord means boss, and if you say frog, we jump. If you say go, we go. If you tell us here's how you pray, this is how we pray. This is the sign of the Word of God that liberates our hearts and our minds. At the end of that great farewell discourse is the, the radiant, the luminous 17th chapter of John called by most Bible commentary folks, Bible readers, Bible commentators as the high priestly prayer. And if you ever want to know the heart of somebody, pray with them. And here's a whole chapter dedicated to this piercing view into the heart of Jesus to see what matters to him. And as he prays, we see him glorifying the Father. We see him accepting and ratifying what the Father sent him to do. We see him interceding for his disciples, praying that they would be kept complete. And then he says, and I'm praying for those who will believe in me through them. He's, Jesus back at the upper room is praying for us. And his prayers are effective. Later in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prays even more. And this time with great intensity. He knows Judas has done what he's done. Folks are coming with clubs and swords to take him prisoner, hand him over to be, be murdered. He's praying sweat mixed with blood. He is in tremendous, tremendous distress. 
and he says to his father, take this cup from me. And we see the human Jesus, I think like all of us would, when faced with something where our demise is coming. God, if it's your will, let this not happen to me. But then he says, not my will, but thine be done. He is so close to Father God. This is the sign of relationship and devotion. After these things, fellowship and worship, a sign of servanthood, giving God's word and the prayer. If you read the accounts, and then the disciples sing a hymn and go out. He sings. In the middle of all of this, he sings. Madam musician, I hope you'd take great uh, comfort and inspiration from that. He sings. He's going to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men. But he can do nothing but extol the praises of Almighty God. And he gives us that sign of praise. The thing that of all the things in the world we can't take us when we go to be with Jesus. The gift of singing is one thing that travels. So get good at it. This is just the rehearsal for the main event, right? He sings. Then he's betrayed into the hands of sinful men. His holy bucket list is accomplished. And now he's ready to make atonement for the sins of a lost and broken world. So I raise the question again, brothers and sisters. If you had one day to live, what would you do? All of the spiritual masters through the ages, all the people who are deeply devoted to Jesus, to the life of prayer, to the totally consecrated, sold out life to Jesus, they all speak of living in the present with eternity in mind. They know that if we contemplate our deaths, that will actually make us live more fully. It's a great paradox. I believe most of us here would do many of the things that Jesus did. We would do these important things. We'd gather with loved ones, probably have a great meal, wash feet, maybe. Well, we would serve those we love. We would thank them for the gift of themselves through the years. We would forgive anyone that's done wrong, I would hope, and ask forgiveness for the wrongs that we have done. Last instructions, we probably do some of that too. Take care of so-and-so. Handle this thing. And we might pray for ourselves and for our loved ones. And we might be praying hard to the Father and commending ourselves to him and saying, I'm going to be with you soon. If we could live like that, if we can live knowing that there is a shelf life for every person in the shop, a sell by date, if you will, that every day we have is a gift of God. Every relationship is precious and with God's power should be infused with the holy. I think we would live better lives. Would we sing? I hope so. I'd get my guitar out and play it just as badly as I always have. Sing God's praises. Would we extol God's great love? Sing prayers, sing hymns of thanksgiving? Beloved, I, we all have a day-to-day -day routine. We got stuff to do, jobs or raising kids or family or whatever it is God calls us to do in, in our various callings, and those are, are good. But too many of us have overcrowded our lives with pursuits 
that do not line up with God's eternal purposes. Too much screen time. And boy, are the reports coming in from the mental health professionals all over the world saying it will make you depressed and anxious and maybe a little crazy. So in God's name, as your loving pastor, I'd say, cut it the hell out. The hell, so I mean that. And maybe we spend too much of our lives working and not being in relationship with family and friends. But God wants us to keep all of the things rightly in balance. Yes, we have work to do and life obligations. We have family. God calls us to carve out time to worship him. But most of us have a list of things that we could declutter and take some time and say no to some things that have been crowding out our time of devotion to the Lord just to be with him. So, if you had one day to live, what would you do? So let us all dwell deeply on that and live in the now with eternity in mind. Fellow servants of our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night before his death, Jesus set an example for his disciples by washing their feet, an act of humble service. He taught that strength and growth in the life of the kingdom of God come not by worldly power and authority, but by such lowly service. Therefore, I invite you who share in the royal priesthood of Christ to come forward that we may recall whose servants we are by following the example of our master. Come now remembering his admonition that what will be done for you is also to be done by you to others. Engrave on your hearts and mirror in his, your actions Jesus' words. A servant is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So, there are seats, there will be buckets here at the front that the altar guild are, uh, are preparing. Um, if you wish to wash someone's feet, find that person and bring them forward.
The Lord Jesus, rising from supper, laid aside his outer garments, took a towel, and washed his disciples' feet. Then he said to them, Do you understand what I have done for you? If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Our service continues with the prayers of the people on page 128. <clears throat> Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and the unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy. For Foley, our Archbishop, and Stephen, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially Joseph, our president, Roy, our governor, the legislatures and courts, and those in the armed services. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, Lord, in your mercy, for all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Top of page 130. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, 
He is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. As you're able, please stand. Beloved in Christ, the, the peace, peace of the, the Lord, Lord be always, always with, with you. you. Greet your neighbor in the name of the Lord. You may be seated. Quick announcements. Tomorrow night, the Good Friday service is at 7. On Easter Sunday, the services are 7 a.m., 9 o'clock, and 11. It's actually going to be, the 11 o'clock service will be a baptism service. Um, the Logan family will be receiving friends Easter afternoon from 5 to 7 at Forest Lawn. And the funeral for their son Ryan will be Monday morning at uh, 9.30. So please be here for those. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and a sacrifice to God.
Please stand. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty, for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you're exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own haven't we given you. On page 132. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And on the night before he suffered, he instituted these holy mysteries, that we, receiving the benefits of his passion and resurrection, might be made partakers of his divine nature. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. seated. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, 
where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the feast. We do not presume to come to this, your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs from under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
you can turn in your prayer books to page 137. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. If you can turn in your prayer books to page 292. Page 292. There is no blessing and dismissal to this service. It flows through as one act with Good Friday, uh, which we will start tomorrow evening. As you, if you would like to be seated, we will recite Psalm 22 together, during which the altar guild will be stripping the altar. Page 292. Together we say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? and are so far from my cry and from the words of my complaint. O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. In the night season also, but I find no rest. But you remain holy, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our fathers hoped in you. They trusted in you and you delivered them. They called upon you and were delivered. They put their trust in you and were not confounded. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and the outcast of the people. All those who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and shake their heads, saying, he trusted in God that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him if he will have him. But you are he that took me out of my mother's womb. You were my hope when I was yet upon my mother's breasts. is near at hand, and there is none to help me. Many oxen have come around me. Fat bulls of bash enclose me on every side. They gape at me with their mouths, like a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart also in the midst of my body is like melting wax. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaves to my gums. And you bring me into the dust of death. And the counsel of the wicked laid siege against me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I count, count all my bones. They stand, stand staring and looking upon, upon me. They cast my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. But be not far from me, O Lord. You are my succor. Hasten to help me. Deliver me. Jacob, 
despised, nor abhorred the low estate of the poor. He has not hidden his face from him, but when he has called upon him, he heard him. My praise is of you in the great congregation. My vows will I perform in the sight of those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek after the Lord shall praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and be turned unto the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For the kingdom is the Lord's. He is the governor. All those who are how shall they kneel before him? But my life, my children shall worship him. They shall tell of the Lord to the generations to come, and to a people yet unborn shall they declare his righteousness. <laughs> 